Well, welcome uh, back. Glad that you're here this morning. I'm going to uh, show our little video, a uh, little bit more of the history and the life of St. Peter's. This goes back to 1903. Um, and then, uh, then I'll have Jane come forward at that point. But let's watch this. As if they were sinking. Whoops. The plans to go ahead and build a new church. In early 1903, the passing of Pastor C.A. Troutman spread a gloom over the membership of St. Peter's. They felt as if they were sinking. The plans to go ahead and build a new church and the naming of a new pastor would carry St. Peter's through during this difficult time period. The original decision to build a new church had been made a year earlier, in February of 1902. The 1871 church building needed several repairs, and it was decided by a vote of 70 to 4 to build a new church instead. The voting members also resolved that two-thirds of the cost must be subscribed before they began to build, and that the church should not cost more than $15,000. A building committee led by Pastor Troutman was formed, and it decided to hire architect J.W. Gaddis of Vincennes. His plans for the building were accepted, and the church dimensions were to be 61 feet by 90 feet, and the church front would face 5th Street rather than Sycamore. After the passing of Pastor Troutman, the congregation decided to carry on the plans, with the temple glorifying God and also serving as a monument for its late pastor. In March of 1903, the congregation also rejoiced at the news that Frederick Wamsgans accepted the call to be the next pastor of St. Peter's. What I find kind of interesting is that, uh, so I mentioned Pastor Wamsgans, who was called in 1903, um, about 12 years ago, um, I was invited down to Lakeland, Florida uh, to preach at a church's 100th anniversary. And the reason I was invited to preach was because, well, two reasons. Number one was I knew the pastor at the church in Lakeland. But secondly, Pastor Wasconsin, who was called at Saint, to St. Peter's in 1904, uh, his son uh, was a church planter to start this new church in Lakeland, Florida. And St. Peter's gave a significant gift um, uh, to start that church. And so uh, St. Peter's had given a significant gift to help them get going. Um, and so, and I knew the pastor down there now, so he'd invited me to come down. But again, just kind of the, some of the stories, the behind the scenes kind of things about the life of, of uh, St. Peter's. Jan Keel is with us today. Uh, Jan is our director of LifeWorks Ministry, and they're, they do such great work, and there's so many things they're involved in. I'll let Jan tell you about that. Um, but, but there may be some areas of ministry where you can benefit or where people whom you know or love could benefit from the work of, uh, of LifeWorks. So, Jan, thanks for being here. This isn't amplifying, but it's going into the, into the camera, so it is actually working. Okay, thank you. I, I distributed a, a handout just that gives a broad overview of all of the LifeWorks ministries. Um, LifeWorks kind of launched about, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, sort of split off from pastoral care just because we were doing a lot of things and they both deserve their own department, if you will. And so there's two basic areas of, of LifeWorks. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the counseling and recovery piece, most of which happens over at the LifeWorks house, I don't know, how many of you know about the LifeWorks house? Okay, it's right across the street from the gym on the backside of the arts cleaners. And it's, it's uh, uh, you, it doesn't look like much on the outside, but it's amazing on the inside. And so St. Peter's was gracious in developing, remodeling that. We moved in there two years ago, and that's what we do. Uh, we have eight um, licensed counselors, and uh, we bill Medicaid and insurance and, um, so we have a, a professional counseling center over there. Lisa Pine is gonna come in a few weeks and talk about our intensive outpatient program that we have over there. Um, the other side of LifeWorks um, is the, the social ministries or the walking alongside um, that we like to do. And, and that, uh, Melissa Clark is a licensed clinical social worker and she serves both as our, our school social worker and she also sees clients over at LifeWorks House. And um, we seek to, one, equip people to walk alongside others, um, which 
has been a great vision of Mark's that nobody would have to face challenging circumstances alone. And then also we um, connect people when they need someone to walk alongside them. And whether that's professional or lay, um, we just wanna make sure that nobody has to go through life um, alone. So a um, little short thing on LifeWorks, if you have any questions, um, let me know. Any questions of Jan? So Jan, her, uh, she's licensed as a marriage and family therapist. And then she mentioned uh, a team of eight. Uh, and it's kind of maybe the best kept secret in Columbus. People oftentimes wonder where can I go for counseling. And Jan has just developed a, a great ministry and a great team over there. So, so if you would benefit from that, if you know others who would benefit, and then she said Lisa will be in, in a few weeks to talk about our intensive outpatient program for those who live with addiction and want uh, some help in walking alongside of them in that way. So, Jan, thanks for being here. I appreciate it. Thanks yeah. very much. So if you were not with us last week, just a reminder that uh, the classes are always found on YouTube. Last week, when I asked if the camera was running, it wasn't running. Um, and so what we did was, Dean and I, I recorded when COVID first hit in, what was it, March of, well, when we had to shut down in March of 2020, um, I did uh, a Bible investigation class just in his little office with the green screen behind me. And so what we were able to do is we were able to pull from the first half. I, found, I told Dean, here's where I started the, the material. And uh, so take it uh, up to wherever you actually push the button to start. So it's kind of a, a twofold. One is me sitting behind a desk. And then the rest of it is uh, of me standing up here last week. But just know that, uh, that the material is, uh, was available on our YouTube channel. And, uh, so, and if you have friends that want to see that, a number of years ago, uh, we have a husband and wife uh, team at St. Peter's. And the husband's since gone to heaven, but Harlan and Caroline Clems. And Harlan was a Lutheran educator for many, many years. And then toward the end of his ministry, they would go up to Alaska and spend, I don't remember, six months or five months out of the year and do ministry in Alaska, different villages. And of course, Alaska is huge. It's what, a whole lot bigger than Texas. And they would take uh, cassette tapes, this was years ago, cassette tapes of our Bible investigation class and they would mail that to different villages in the area. And then people would gather in, uh, in like community centers and they would watch our Bible investigation class and Harlan and Caroline, then when they would make their trips to the different villages, would kind of answer questions or be a part of that. So, uh, so uh, if you have friends that you think would benefit from our Bible investigation class who live wherever, they could live in another country, um, that's certainly available um, to them. So if you'd be sure to put your name on the white sheet that's on the table, that's helpful for me. And uh, today we are picking up on uh, the section, that the lesson on God. And um, we last time covered, I think, the questions under how can we know there is a God. Is that right? So I think, if, I, if my notes are correct, we got down through Psalm 14. Uh, did we talk about Exodus? Did we talk about the name of God? Did we maybe pick up on that? Is that where we left off? Okay. So we left off there. So, so yeah, so God has given to us a name by which to know him. And that name is Yahweh. Now, there are a number of names given to God in the scriptures, a number of titles that are very descriptive of who he is. Uh, but Yahweh is one of the very significant names that we have of God. Uh, and it is uh, sometimes pronounced Jehovah. Uh, I don't say that to give credence to uh, those who hold to the Jehovah Witness faith because the Jehovah Witness have a very different understanding of who God is, <clears throat> a very different understanding of the scriptures, a very different understanding of salvation, than what uh, uh, many of us would hold. <coughs> but understand that, that Yahweh can sometimes be translated as Jehovah. And when you find the word Lord in the Bible, all capital letters, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that's where you find uh, the name Yahweh uh, in the scriptures. And there is a, a title for God, and that's Elohim. So if we're talking about the president, Elohim is like Mr. President, that's his title. Uh, Yahweh is his name. Uh, Joe Biden, Donald Trump, Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, uh, you know, George Bush, or so forth. So a name as well as a title that he's given to us to know him by. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, simply says the Lord is one, that the Lord is one. We, Christianity is a monotheistic uh, religion. Uh, Islam is a monotheistic, re monotheistic religion. The God of Islam 
is uh, understood very differently as described in the Quran and as described by uh, Muslims than the God of the Bible. But monotheistic simply means one God. Mono means one. Theist uh, comes from the word theos, which is the Greek word for God. So monotheistic believes in one God. So Christianity is a monotheistic religion. We're Trinitarian. We believe that God has revealed himself in three separate persons, but that God is, there's only one God. Um, Hinduism is polytheistic. Hinduism believes in many gods, poly meaning many. So Hinduism has hundreds of millions of gods. Uh, if you travel to India, to a large city in India, uh, you can walk down a street and find little shrines, and each of them dedicated to a different god. Uh, so hundreds of millions of, of different gods uh, of Hinduism. So uh, Christianity believes that God has described himself in the scriptures as being one God. Now look at Matthew chapter 3. Matthew, the first book in the New Testament. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Matthew chapter 3 is on page 896. 896. And verse 17, uh, where we want to take a look at 16, is on the next page, page 897. The setting here is the Jordan River. And this is the Jordan River. I've got a picture of the Jordan River here. I think I mentioned to you that the Jordan River is about the size of Hall Creek. It's not like the Ohio River. It's not like the Mississippi River. It's about the size of Hall Creek. This could be Hall Creek. Um, and uh, sometimes the Jordan River uh, is uh, waist deep. Sometimes it can be up to your chest. Sometimes it may be ankle deep. just depends on where you are in the time of year. But this is the Jordan River where Jesus was baptized. And so when we come to Matthew chapter 3, we, find, we come to the time of Jesus' baptism. And Jesus now... Um, who lives up in Nazareth, about uh, 70 miles, actually probably about 90 miles to the north of, of where this spot is where he was baptized. Uh, and he had come down here to the Jordan where John the Baptist was preaching and he was going to be baptized. So in Matthew chapter 3, uh, let's just start with verse 13. It says, Then Jesus came from Galilee, up north where Nazareth is located, or the, uh, the more lush area. Uh, uh, he came to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, uh, saying, I need to baptize you, uh, and do you come to me? Uh, but Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then, Jesus, then John consented. When Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water. And behold, whenever you find the word behold, that's like, a, like sirens flashing and lights flashing. Uh, in the King James, it's low, L-O, um, and lo, I am with you always. But behold, in a lot of other translations, is like pay attention because what follows is really a big deal. And behold, it says, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God, that's the Holy Spirit, descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, again, pay attention, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. So here, what's going on here? We have here in this account all three persons of the Godhead who show up and are present at the baptism of Jesus. So you have God the Son, Jesus, in bodily form, human form. You've got God the Holy Spirit who, is, uh, who takes on the form of a dove. He's not a dove. He's in spirit form. By the way, the word spirit simply means a personal being without flesh and blood. A personal being without flesh and blood. So angels are spirits. They're angelic spirits. They're not humans. When we die, we don't become angels. Some people think, well, now another, they'll say, now another angel gets its wings. No, that's not very good theologically. I mean, it's not. We, we will never become angels. We are humans. Angels are angels. Humans are humans. Uh, and and, and a, an angel is a spirit. An angel is a personal being, an angelic being, without flesh and blood. The demons, likewise. Uh, the demons were good angels until... They chose to follow after and break away from God and follow after Lucifer, who was also an angel. So, so, the Holy, so God, the Bible says, is spirit. So God, the Holy Spirit, who here descends in the form of a dove, is really in spirit form. The Holy Spirit is not a dove. The Holy Spirit is not tongues of fire, but can manifest itself in certain forms. God the Father is not an old man with long white hair and a long gray beard. God the Father is in spirit form. 
God the Son, Jesus, before he took on human flesh. By the way, one of the uh, terms that we use in one of our creeds is we say of Jesus that he was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary. And I would challenge our people, if I were to go in there to the sanctuary, during a worship, say, we just spoke the words of the Nicene Creed. What does that word incarnate mean? And I guarantee you, a lot of them would have no clue. What's chili con carne? Chili with what in it? Meat. To be incarnate means that God took on flesh. He took on meat. That God was in spirit form, a personal being without flesh and blood, and God the Son was incarnate. He took on flesh. That's all it means. He was incarnate by the Holy Spirit. What's that mean? The Bible says, remember Mary said to the angel, when the angel said, you're going to uh, conceive, and she said, how can that be? I've never been with a man. She said, the, whole, the, uh, it said the, Holy, uh, the angel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Uh, and so she conceived somehow by the power of the Holy Spirit. So at the baptism of Jesus, we have all three persons of the Godhead present. We have God the Son, who now has taken on human flesh, has become incarnate. That took place when he was implanted into the womb of a virgin named Mary 2,000 years ago. And we have God the Holy Spirit, who is in spirit form, but can at times manifest himself in different forms, and as he does here, in the form of a dove. And then God the Father, who speaks and says, This is my Son, whom I love. So all three persons of the Godhead are present uh, at the baptism of Jesus. That's why we have behold or lo, pay attention, this is a big deal, uh, heads up. John chapter 1, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Go to John chapter 1. Remember I said that one of the, uh, the I think the most critical theological question that anyone needs to answer is, who's Jesus? Who is he? Uh, is he simply a good man who taught us life lessons? Who is he? Was he just a miracle worker? Um, in John chapter 1, verse 1, page 981, it says, In the beginning was the Word. And notice that's capitalized. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay, so the word, Word, in the Greek language, remember we said every now and then we'll refer to the original languages. The word, Word, is the word logos from which we get the word logo. So if we're driving down the interstate <clears throat> and we see up ahead these great big golden arches with no lettering, but we know that's McDonald's, right? If we're watching a football game or a basketball game on TV and on the uniform we see what some would refer to as a check mark, but they call it a swoosh, we know that's Nike. That's the logo. The golden arches is McDonald's. The swoosh is Nike. In the beginning was the Logos. And the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. Verse 18, or verse 14, and the Word, the Logos, became flesh, incarnate. Who are we talking about? We're talking about Jesus. And dwelt among us. The word dwelt means he tented among us. He set up his tabernacle among us. A tent is temporary. A tent isn't permanent. So when Jesus came, he came on a temporary basis. He came for 33 years. He didn't come to stay forever. He came for a, a certain period of time. And then John says, and we have seen his glory. John, who wrote this, was with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus stood up there on that mountain and he began to radiate. I mean, they had to look away. It says, we have seen his glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So, in the beginning was Jesus. And Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. I mentioned that those folks who hold to uh, an understanding of God through the Jehovah Witness faith, doesn't mean, I'm not saying they're bad people, I'm just saying they have a different understanding of who God is. And, and their Bible has uh, some different wording here. Their Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a, small g, God, one of many. Um, um, Latter-day Saints also have a very different understanding of who God is. Uh, good people, but a very different understanding of, of who God is based upon the Scriptures. So what this says is that in the beginning, and in the beginning takes us back to what? Genesis chapter 1, right? 
In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And, and oftentimes in the scriptures, we find these phrases in the New Testament that take us back and connect us with the Old. To say that the Old Testament doesn't matter is just bad theology. It's bad biblical understanding. The Old Testament is just as relevant and appropriate as the New. The teachings of Jesus are based, most everything Jesus says can find its roots in the writings of Moses. Jesus grew up a Jew. He understood the Jewish scriptures. So uh, what does this say? This says in John chapter 1 that Jesus was God. You say, well, I'm not sure about that. Look at John chapter 8, verse 58. John chapter 8, verse 58, page 992. So in John chapter 8, verse 58, we find Jesus uh, with his uh, disciples, with his followers, and they are uh, gathered with some of the religious leaders. And some of the religious leaders, Jewish, are boasting about their lineage. Uh, it's a big deal that they you know, can trace their lineage back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And sometimes in churches, people can play those games too. Now, I'm not, I'm not aiming at anybody, okay? Because not everybody with these last names plays these games. In fact, very, very rarely. But you know, I mean, there are a lot of Burbrinks and Sturmeyers and Finkies and Arnholds and Armiths and Linnips, and, and families whose roots go back like five, six, seven generations in this community. Once, I had somebody whose name wasn't any of those names, <clears throat> who came into my office and uh, didn't like something that we were doing at St. Peter's. This was early in my ministry, and, uh, and I've already warned Pastor John, uh, uh, it, it, early, early on, uh, there may be some who want to play these games with you. And you just listen, be respectful, uh, but understand, uh, don't let yourself get triangulated or trapped with all of this. So this was somebody who didn't like something that we were doing, and so he came into my office. I'd been here maybe three months, and he came into my office, and he, uh, and he, he sat down and he, he began to, uh, the first thing he said was, well, he said, let me show you a map of where my ancestors came from. So he opened up on the table, on my desk, a map of Saxony, Germany. Okay? It's where, we'll find out on the, the last week that we do this, uh, how the German Lutherans came here and they started, what we know is the Lutheran Church, Missouri Center, and all this stuff. And so some of his relatives were actually on the ship, uh, one of the five ships that came over from Germany. What he didn't know is I had relatives on the same ship. <laughs> I didn't say a word. But what he's trying to say, uh, he's got some clout, see, because he can trace his roots back. And then he went on to tell me about how he had uh, uh, some relatives who worked here at St. Peter's for many, many years. And, like, that's supposed to give him additional clout, right? And then he began to, to go on and say, and, and I don't like what you're doing over here. And I said, well, tell me why you don't like that. Well, that's not the way we do it. And I said, well, can you show me in scriptures where that's out of bounds? Well, you all seem to be so concerned about the Bible and pay no attention to synodical uh, guidelines. And I said, listen, the Bible is what we stand on. The Bible is what we stand on. And, and if, if these other things are in sync with the Bible, that's okay. But we stand on the scriptures. And, and so he was getting more frustrated, and finally he said to me, what if I and people like me who don't like what you're doing, what if we just choose to withhold our offerings? Then what are you going to do? So I said, well, the Bible says that the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And it sounds to me like right now you're having a really hard time giving cheerfully to support the work of St. Peter's. So maybe what you might want to do is you find some kind of ministry, apart from St. Peter's, that you can really get behind and enthusiastically support and give your full tithe to that ministry. And then you'll be able to cheerfully support them. God will be honored in your gift, and I'm sure God will take care of us somehow. Well, that's kind of your last straw, right? And some of these, these folks that Jesus was talking to, they were trying to play these games. Make these power moves. And so uh, Jesus says to them, so if we get to verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 58, it says, well, verse uh, 57. 
So the Jews said to Jesus, you are not yet 50 years old, and you've seen Abraham, our ancestor? And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself. I used to think when I was a kid, Jesus was using bad grammar. Before Abraham was born, I am, no, it would be before Abraham was born, I was, until I, I learned that I am is the name of God. Remember back to Moses in the wilderness? I am who I am. Tell them I am sent you. And so what Jesus was saying, they're boasting about Father Abraham and, their, and all their traditions and everything else, and Jesus said, Yahweh. And they considered that blasphemy. And so they picked up stones to stone him. They didn't succeed. It just says he hid himself. This wasn't the first time they tried to kill Jesus. So what we know is that when he was a little baby, or we talked about when Jesus was a little baby, um, Herod tried to kill him because the wise men came and said, where is he who's born king of the Jews? So Herod told his hitmen, go find every boy under the age of two and kill him because I want to make sure I get rid of whoever this threat is to me. And here they tried to kill him. And it happened in other places as well. And yet when they came to arrest him, ultimately in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus said, hey, who are you guys looking for? Jesus of Nazareth, I'm he. Here I am. Come and get me, because now is the time. And what's amazing is, when he said, I am he, John tells us in his gospel that these 600 soldiers who came to arrest him, they all fell down. Like, you don't have any authority over me. You have no, but I'm laying down my life. I'm letting you take my life, because I came in order to pay the price for the sins of all humanity, and now is the time. It wasn't time when I was a little baby. It wasn't the time when you tried to throw rocks at me. It wasn't the time when I was in the synagogue in Nazareth, and I said, now the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. You tried to push me off the cliff. You, you, you guys have no authority over me. Yahweh. Either Jesus is who he claims to be, or he's the greatest con man who ever lived. You know, if I walked in this room and started saying that I was God, you'd walk out of the room, right? And you should. Either Jesus is who he claims to be, or he's the greatest egomaniac who ever walked the face of the earth. I believe that he is who he claims to be. And in Acts chapter 5, it says, I'm just going to summarize this. This is an account where a guy named Ananias and his wife Sapphira, uh, they were part of the church, the Jerusalem church. And what was going on was there was a lot of persecution against the church. And so a lot of the folks were going on, falling on very difficult times. And they weren't able to, uh, many of them were losing their jobs because their Jewish employers said, if you're going to be a, a Jew and follow Jesus, then you better find another job. Or if they had Jewish landlords, and I don't say this to slam the Jews because Jesus was a Jew. The apostles were Jews. I'm not saying this to slam the Jews, but I'm saying that there was among the Jews those who believed that Jesus was who he claimed to be and those who didn't. And those who didn't were trying to make life miserable for those who did. And so if you're, a, if you're renting from a Jewish landlord, in those, they're saying, listen, find another place to live. If you're employed by a Jewish employer, find another place to work. And so there was, they were struggling. And so what was happening was you had people who didn't have the ability to feed themselves, their, their family, they had no place to stay, and the church stepped up. You know, there's all this conversation in our culture about what's the role of the government and what's the role of the church and what's the role of everybody when it comes to caring for one another. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not putting down or criticizing what the government does to be generous. Don't hear me saying that. I am not saying that. I'm not saying the government should do nothing, but I'm saying the church should do something. If the church is simply pushing people away to go to um, Uncle Sam, then the church has dropped the ball. Because the church has called to care for one another. Jan said one of the things that, that I brought up with our staff a long time ago is nobody in our church should have to walk through challenges alone. And I said nobody in our church should be homeless. We've had homeless people in our church. This is a big church. We've had homeless people. We've had people who slept in their cars and slept under bridges until we find out about it. And so that's just an understanding. Nobody from St. Peter's will be homeless if we know about it. And if we know about it, we will find a way to get them a place to stay. Because that's just wrong. The church, if, if we have people 
in our family at St. Peter's who are homeless and sleeping on the streets. We need to do something about that. So um, as we deal with, uh, so Ananias and Sapphira were among those who said, we're going to give something to help others. So they had a piece of property. Let's say they had a piece of property at, I don't know, Grandview, and they were going to build on it. And they said, listen, we've already got a house. We really don't need a second house. And that piece of property is worth, I don't know, $100,000, maybe more. Uh, but So we're going to give that $100,000, and we're going to sell that lot, and we're going to give that to the cause t- to help the church, help the people. And, and so they didn't have to give it all. Nobody said you had to do it. They could have given 50000 and kept 50000 but they said they gave it all. They were not being honest. So, so let's say they kept 50000 and they gave 50000 which is a great gift, and if they'd just been up front and honest, it would have been fine. But they said, oh, we gave it all. They were trying to like, pat themselves on the back. And so Jesus said, uh, and so, uh, so the, that, that Jesus, the church, uh, when they learned that they were being dishonest, um, they called them on it. And when they were given an opportunity to come clean and they lied about it, they just dropped dead on the spot. Fortunately, God doesn't deal with us that way these days, right? <laughs> so, um, but they said, you lied, you lied to the Holy Spirit, you lied to God. My point is, when we talk about the three persons of the Godhead, that the Holy Spirit is also referred to as God in the scriptures. So these three different persons um, of the Godhead. So if you have, for example, like, so who is the one true God? Well, the Bible says that there's one God, but the God who reveals himself in three separate distinct persons. So you've got the le- one word, God, with three different letters. Uh, you've got one God, but three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, we have a triangle. If you erase any side of that triangle, you don't have a triangle, right? You, I mean, you can, if you erase any side, and if you try to remove any one of those persons from the Godhead, you don't have God for who he has revealed himself to be. God says, I am one God, but I'm three separate persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And yet they're separate and distinct. So uh, God the Father is not God the Son. They're two separate persons. God the Son is not God the Holy Spirit. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, God the Father wasn't nailed to a cross. God the Holy Spirit wasn't nailed to the cross. God the Son, Jesus, was nailed to the cross. When Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane and said, Father, if it be your will, take this cup from me. This, I, I, if there's any other plan that we can call, any other audible we can call, because I really am not looking forward to the cross. If there's any other, He wasn't talking to himself. He was talking to the Father. At his baptism, Jesus was bodily present in the water. God the Holy Spirit came down upon him in the form of a dove, and God the Father spoke and said, this is my three separate persons. Maybe another uh, uh, little illustration of that is, um, and and I don't know, because nothing's a perfect match, but I think like of H2O. H2O is one compound, right? But it has three different forms. Uh, solid, liquid, and gas, water, ice, and steam. So water is H2O, uh, steam is H2O, ice is H2O, but water is not ice and ice is not steam. Three separate expressions of H2O. So when God says, turn the spotlight on himself and says, listen, I'm one God, but I'm, I'm, I reveal myself as three separate persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, if you, you say, I'm, I'm struggling to understand that, uh, I am too. But I believe that because that's what the scriptures say. So, um, let's turn over to the next page. What is God like? Psalm 90 uh, says God is eternal. Um, we can look at that quickly. Psalm 90. Page uh, 551, 551, the heading is a prayer of Moses. Most of the Psalms were written by David, or I should say David, David was the author of more Psalms than anybody else. This one was a Psalm of Moses, and it says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Um, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. God is eternal. 
Sometimes when I visit the kids in the school, and they'll say, well, when did God begin? God didn't have a beginning. God always has been. The Bible says in uh, the book of Isaiah, I, I, actually, actually, the name Yahweh means always was, always is, and always will be. God always has been. Before there was an earth, before there were stars, before there was water, God always has been. In Hebrews chapter 1, it says of Jesus, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. Jesus, Yahweh, always has been. So God is eternal, and God will always be here. So in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament, as we refer to it as the Old Testament. Jesus wouldn't have called it the Old Testament because Jesus didn't have a New Testament. Uh, but Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, page uh, 891, page 891, uh, this is the section where God speaks about bringing the full tithe into the storehouse. We talked about that in a sermon a few weeks ago. But in verse 6, God says, For I, the Lord, that's Yahweh, see all capital letters, I, Yahweh, uh, do not change. So God does not change. So, so a lot of things change. Um, uh, we change. You know, if you don't believe it, look at yourself in the mirror uh, now and then open up your high school yearbook. We change, right? We change in our attitudes towards certain things. I've changed in my attitude towards certain things over the years. Maybe I, I stood very firmly with this kind of attitude at one time in my life, and now I have a very different attitude uh, towards something. So we change, but God doesn't change. So when God says to us in the scriptures, listen, this is what's for your good, and so I encourage you to do it, and this is probably not for your good, so I encourage you not to do it, God doesn't change. So what God says to us 3,500 years ago through Moses is still just as relevant for what God says to us today. Or when God says to us through Jeremiah um, 2,500 years ago, I have loved you with an everlasting love, that's just as trustworthy today as it was then. Or what Paul wrote 2,000 years ago, nothing in all creation can ever separate us from the love of God, is just as good today as it was back then. So God doesn't change. We change. Our society changes. How we do things changes. You know, the man that came into my office when I'd been here for three months who didn't like some of the things that we were doing because it's not what, the way he grew up. Um, the Word of God doesn't change. But how we do things... You know, when I grew up, uh, my pastor uh, wore a black robe, a black like choir gown. That was his, those were his vestments when he came to church. And then I went to the seminary, because I went to the same church all the time. I went to the seminary, and I see guys in these white things called albs, uh, or, or a, a black thing with a white thing over it called a cassock and a surplus. I thought, what's that? I've never seen that before. There's no right or wrong. The Bible doesn't say what, what the clergy has to wear. That's ridiculous. Um, uh, when I was a kid, when we went to communion, we drank from a common cup. And kids today would say, that's gross. <laughs> and it kind of is, because I've served the common cup, you know. And so, you know, you've got like, and there's nothing wrong with wearing lipstick if you wear lipstick. But ladies, when you wear a lot of lipstick, it, it sticks on that cup. And so you're serving it, and then you got a little, little rag, you know, and you're trying to wipe off that, oh, cause, man, she had a lot of lipstick on. Because you don't want to give that to somebody else. They say, oh, the germs. And then they used to tell us, oh, the alcohol in the wine will kill the germs. Well, <laughs> in COVID time, are you going to believe that? <laughs> you know, and so now we use individual cups. When I was pastoring in Davenport, Iowa, this was kind of when individual cups were kind of coming in. They were the, the end thing, and they were glass. And so the altar guild ladies had to wash those glass individual cups after every service. And then somebody invented plastic communion cups. Wow, well, we can throw those away. But some people thought, well, throw away those. We shouldn't be using those. Is that like sacrilegious? Is there something wrong with that? We do things differently. When I was growing up in the church, the worship service was either page 5 or 15 in the hymnal that we had. When we had communion, it was page 15 order of service. When it was page 5, uh, no communion, it was page 5 order of service. Nothing wrong with that. And now... Uh, the majority of our churches have alternative styles of worship. Not in South Central Indiana, because we're in South Central Indiana. But many, 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 many of our Lutheran churches have contemporary services, they have more traditional services, they have other... So how we do things in the church may change. But the scriptures don't. And God doesn't. And we need to stand firm on that. So 
God does not uh, change. Matthew 19 uh, simply says, with God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. Uh, and the fancy term there is omnipotent. Uh, that God is, there's, a, I remember a guy named uh, J.B. Phillips wrote a book, and he either entitled it, uh, Your God is Too Small, or How Big is Your God, something like that. And, and his question was, listen, when you're going through a hard time, and you're like fretting over things, and that's, that's normal, that's human, but do you believe that God can deal with that? I mean, when you pray for rain, do you go find your umbrella? I think, I don't, if I told the story in here, maybe I told it somewhere else, of a, we had a husband and wife, did I tell you about the husband and wife who came to me and said they were gonna get divorced and they, so, so I was in Davenport, I tell Davenport stories because Columbus is too small of a town, everybody <laughs> knows everybody. So back in Davenport, husband and wife, I, I was there for nine years and uh, they came into my office, they wanted to meet with me and these were great people, I loved them and he was an elder and she was very active in the church and they were probably around in their late 50s I'm going to guess at the time and they they said to me we want to talk to you because we've decided to get a divorce which which was really like surprising because I didn't I didn't know I didn't sense anything that was talking about issues well what had happened was that he had been repeatedly unfaithful to her uh, in their marriage and she finally got to the point to say I'm tired of it I'm how many times do I have to deal with this? This, just, this breaks my heart, it crushes me. And she had biblical reason to be divorced if she chose to be divorced. And he, you know, he was an elder. I mean, I, I didn't know if this was going on. And none of the elders knew this was going on. So I said to them, I said, uh, listen, uh, you have every biblical right uh, to get a divorce if you choose to do that. So I'm just gonna ask you to do one thing, because I knew these people pretty well, and I considered them <coughs> friends. They were certainly old enough to be my parents, if not almost my grandparents, not quite. But I said to them, um, would you do one thing for me before you talk to the, the attorney? Would you um, pray together uh, once a day for the next month? I said, you don't have to hold hands, you don't have to sit right next, but would you pray together? Which I knew was a big ask. But I thought I could ask them to do that. I thought they'd, and they said, yeah, we'll do that. And then I said, after a month, then let me know what you decide. And so whatever you decide, okay. And they didn't even wait a month. They waited about three weeks and they said, can we see you again? And I said, yes. So they came in and they said, we've decided not to get a divorce. And God was working healing in their lives. And he'd come across the book that he gave to me. It was called The Myth of the Greener Grass. To say, listen, you can go running around on your wife, but listen, that's not going to. And he began to share that book with other men. He began to be honest, and he began to share that book with other men. And I saw them on Facebook. We're Facebook friends. They're in their 90s now. And uh, there they were, the two of them, with smiles on their face. You know, they're still married. Uh, so, so, so how big is your God? We have a God for whom nothing is impossible. And, and that's not to say, and, I, and I'm not saying, uh, I'm not attacking those who have been divorced. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying here was a situation where it was pretty hopeless. And God, I think, really worked a miracle in their life. I remember that there was a, a pastor in our, uh, in, uh, in our county a Lutheran pastor, and he'd been diagnosed with, um, uh, with cancer. And he wasn't very old. He was older than I was, but uh, I'm going to guess he was maybe early 40s at the time. Well, Larry, you may remember this. And uh, he said to me, he said, Mark, I understand your elders pray uh, for people if they have requests. He says, my elders don't really do that. And I said, he said, would your elders be willing to come and pray for me? And I said, sure. So we had four or five elders. I think Pastor Mike Malinsky and I went with the elders. We went to his house. And uh, the next day, or two days later, he was to have another scan um, because his cancer was fairly advanced. I don't remember if it was stage three or stage four, but it was fairly advanced. And so we prayed for him. And uh, he called me later that week after he'd gone to the doctor and he said, they can't find any cancer. 
Now, that doesn't mean that every time we pray that God, because we've been asked to pray and, and people die. But my point is, the doctors were like scratching their head like, uh, we sure didn't do anything to remove that cancer. So my, to say that with God all things are possible, with God all things are possible. And, and never give up on him. And it doesn't mean that if you have cancer or grandma has cancer and you pray and, it, and the cancer's not taken away, it's, don't beat yourself up. You know, some will give you the impression, well, you didn't have enough faith. If, you're, if you had greater faith, baloney. The Apostle Paul had this thorn in the flesh. I don't know what it was, but some kind of ailments, uh, different theories on what it was. And Paul repeatedly said, God, would you please take this thorn away? And God said, no, nope, Paul, I'm not going to, but my, my grace will be sufficient. I'm, I will give you what you need to make it through. Uh, Jesus, I mentioned in the sermon today, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, if there's any way to take this cup from me, if there's any other way, and the Father said, no, you got to, no. And it doesn't mean that our faith is, is not strong, but God in his wisdom sometimes chooses not to do that. Jeremiah 23 says that God is everywhere. He's omnipresent. You can't hide from God. You can't pull the shades from God. You know, where Debbie and I live, um, we, the houses are pretty close together. And uh, I bet there's not 20 feet uh, between our houses, maybe 15 feet. And they're kind of staggered a little bit, you know, so you're not looking right into one from one bedroom to the next bed. But they're close. And so sometimes uh, I will pull down the shades. You can't close the shades on God. I mean, you can close them, but you can't hide from God. He's everywhere. And sometimes there are things that we think, well, I'm, I'm going to hide this from the neighbors, or I'm going to hide this from the people who drive by. But you can't hide anything from God. Here's what's amazing, is that where well, you can't hide anything from God, he doesn't love you any less. I mean, there may be some things that we do in secret because we know it's not the right thing to do. People do that. And the God who knows everything about us still loves us with a perfect love. That's the God of whom we speak in the scriptures. And then Psalm 139 says that he knows all things. He knows, all, he knows everything about us, and he still loves us. There are no surprises. Sometimes when I pray, people, if they'll come in. Yesterday, I listened to a man talk for a long time. He's going through some difficult things in his life. And, uh, and I, I didn't know, I mean, these were new things to me uh, about what's going on in his world. And uh, so we prayed. And, and oftentimes I'll say, God, we're coming before your throne not because we need to inform you of anything. I mean, he already knows it. But we're coming because we need you. We're looking to you. We are, we are in need of you right now. Um, and then Isaiah chapter 6 says that God is holy. <coughs> says that God is holy. And the word holy has two different definitions. One means to be without sin, and he certainly is holy in that way. The other means to be unique or one of a kind or set apart. So we talked about the Bible as the holy Bible, not because the Bible is a book without sin. I mean, the Bible, if you made the Bible into a movie, I mean, it would, it would be more than R-rated. You know, I mean, there's a lot of stuff in the Bible, sex and blood and gore and violence and um, but God is without sin. You know, with God all things are possible, except God can't sin. And God can't tempt us to sin. So I don't ever want you to think that God is going to put you in a position to be tempted. The devil may do that, but the devil doesn't make you sin either. Remember those of us who are a little older, Flip Wilson and Geraldine, the devil made me do it. No, the devil didn't make anybody do it. Uh, we choose to sin. The devil may tempt us, but God will never tempt us. God does not tempt us, and God does not sin. Um, when the Bible says to us, it says that we're to be holy, it means that we're to be set apart. So when the Bible tells us as Jesus followers to be holy, it doesn't mean to be without sin. Good luck with that. Last time I tried, I didn't do very well. You know, the Apostle Paul, the good that I want to do, I don't always do. And the evil that I don't want to do is exactly what I sometimes do. That's all of us, right? Like, I can't believe I did that. I know better than that. Or we have the best of intentions. We wrestle with, Luther talks about how we're both saint and sinner simultaneously. 
you know, we're saint. The word saint simply means we're washed clean in the blood of Jesus. It's, saint is not, I know some people say, you know, some really special people like they, they, they try to uh, vie for sainthood and are they going to be declared saints. Listen, if you weren't a saint the day you died, you're never going to be a saint. Because the word saint, biblically speaking, simply refers to somebody whose sins are washed clean in the blood of Jesus. And we are, Luther said, both saint and sinner simultaneously. At the same time, while I am washed clean in the blood of Jesus, and yet the good I want to do, I don't always do. I struggle with that. So when the Bible says to be holy, some, and I've heard some preachers, some Lutheran preachers, you know, really get on people. You're to be holy. You're to be holy. You're to be righteous. You're to be... Okay. But you just, you just heap it on more guilt. I mean, yes, I'm to seek to honor Christ in what I do. Yes, I'm to seek to be Christ-like. Yes, I'm to reflect the heart of God. Yes, I'm to be generous and I'm to be forgiving and all those kind of things. But holy means I'm to be different than the rest of the world. So Jesus says, listen, I want you to be like me. I want you to be like me. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 32. Now we're going to look at these last couple of verses. Deuteronomy 32. Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Page <clears throat> 193. Page 193. Deuteronomy means second, giving to the law. Deutero means second. Nomos means law. Uh, so Deuteronomy means second giving of the law. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, I'm sorry, yeah, 32, verse 4, it says, the rock, oh, if you heard, were in church this morning, you heard that, and if you're going to church later this morning, you'll hear that, but there, it's a word used for God, the rock, uh, his work is perfect, for all his ways are just, uh, a, a God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is, is he. Um, that he is perfect, it says, and he is um, uh, just. So if you fill in the blanks, perfect and just, what does that mean? To say that God is perfect, I think we understand that. But to say that God is just, what does that mean? To say that God is just means that God must deal with sin, which a lot of people don't like to hear. But, you know, when I was a kid growing up, I could get away with a whole lot more with my parents than I could with my grandparents. You know, if I did something out of line, my grandma might say, now, Mark, come on, you know better than that. That's not the way my mom handled it. Her tone of voice was much louder, and usually there was some physical contact involved. Okay? Um, to say that God is just means that God must punish sin. And that he, he does. The wages of sin, the Bible says, is death. That's separation from God. God must punish sin. Um, but that's just that's, that's turning the spotlight on God only in one that's remember we said the natural knowledge of God God hates sin remember we know when we mess up oops I messed up but when God turns the floodlight on himself look at Exodus chapter 34 Exodus 34 Exodus 34 page uh, 82 verses 6 and 7 It says, the Lord, that's uh, Yahweh again, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, Yahweh, the Lord, a God, Elohim. Uh, remember, feminine ending, feminine plural ending, the three persons uh, in one God. Merciful and gracious, if you're filling the blanks, uh, or compassionate, compassionate, merciful, gracious, uh, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Um, uh, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression of sin. So fill in the blanks. He's compassionate or he's merciful. He's gracious. He's slow to anger. He's abounding in love. He's forgiving. Um, you know, uh, let me give you an illustration of, of, of the love of God here. God must punish sin. So here's a little illustration of a girl we'll call her Sally, and Sally had just gotten her driver's license. And Sally was the first girl in her kind of herd of friends to get her driver's license. I remember, I can still remember when I was 16 years old, or actually 15, and I was one of the later ones in my age group uh, to get my driver's license. 
So in Illinois, where I went to school, I think November 1 was the cutoff date, or the start date. So if your birthday was in December, you were one of the older kids, and my birthday's in the latter part of August. And there was another friend of mine whose birthday was in October. So we had about six or eight guys, and we just, we, we just we did everything together from the time we were in elementary school up through high school. And, uh, and so uh, when the others got their license first, you know, they would, we'd all get in the car and go with them. And, and so here's Sally, and she was the first of her friends to get her license. And so she was going to pick up some of her girlfriends, and they were going to go out that night. And so Sally picks up, you know, a few of her girlfriends. There's one girl who lives out in the country. So she's got to go out on the country roads, and so she's driving. And these girls are having a good time, and they're singing, they're listening to the music, and, and just having a great time. And as she's out on this country road, it wasn't a day like today. The roads were dry and clear, and, and she's just going faster and faster and faster and faster to where she's going 75, 80, 85 miles an hour, not even having a clue how fast she's going. Well, there's a, a, a deputy sheriff who's out there who clocks her going that fast, so she gets a ticket and she has to go before a judge because she was going so fast. And so she goes before the judge and she's in there and the judge kind of gives her a lecture about a young lady, do you know, you know what could have happened? Fortunately, nobody was hurt, but you could have been killed and your friends could have been killed. And, and you could tell she just crushed. I mean, the, uh, Sally was a girl that, like, the only time she'd go to the principal's office was, like, to run an errand for a teacher. You know, I mean, she never went because she was in trouble. And so, um, and so the judge says, well, it says here that uh, this is a fine of $1,000. Well, Sally is 16 years old. She didn't have $1,000. And she just begins to weep, and she says, well, I, I don't have $1,000. And, and then he begins to talk about how, well, if you can't pay a fine of $1,000, then you have to do all this community service and all these other kinds of things. And, and, and she just began to, to break down. And the judge, the judge, as he's sitting there in his judge's robe behind his big judge's desk and his big black leather judge's chair, begins to have some sympathy toward this young lady because he has a daughter about that age. And he's thinking, you know, I could see her doing the same thing. I could see her getting in with her friends and taking off. So the judge thinks about it for a while. And so what he does is he, he pushes himself back from his desk. He takes off his judge's robe. He lays it on the back of his big fancy chair. He comes around. He reaches into his back pocket. He pulls out his wallet. And he pulls out 10 $100 bills. Now, why he's got $1,000 bills, I don't know. But he gives $1,000, and he lays it down there. And, and he walks back around. And, uh, and he puts on his judge's robe, and he sits in his chair, and he says, um, young lady, I, want you to, I don't ever want to see you again in here for doing anything like this. But he said, your fine is $1,000, and your fine has been paid. And he slams down his gavel, and he says, you're free to go. Now, the law said, the law says that a fine of $1,000 has to be paid. It doesn't say that it has to come from her, or her parents, or her friends who took up a, a collection to pay it off. It just said $1,000 has to be paid on her behalf. 2,000 years ago, the one who will judge all of humanity looked down upon his creation, and his heart broke because of his love for every single human being, even looking into the future to people like you and me. Knowing that the wages of sin is death, not just physical death. I mean, we will all die because we all sin. Science will never discover a cure for death. You know, it may discover a cure for certain kinds of cancers and diseases, and we hope that it does, but it'll never discover a cure for death because it'll never discover a cure for sin. But not only does the Bible talk about physical death, but also about separation from God. And the only way for us to be restored in that relationship with God is for the debt for our sin to be paid. So 2,000 years ago, the one who will judge all of humanity stood up from his heavenly throne and he took off his kingly robes and he entered into our world. And there he not only showed us how to live and demonstrated the love of God, but he also paid the price for our sins, not with $1,000, not with a million dollars, but with his life stretched out on a cross. That's the God of the scriptures. Who doesn't say, well, you know, uh, strap a bomb to your body and then go blow up the infidel and I'll let you live in paradise with a thousand beautiful virgins all around. No, 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 no. The God of the scripture says, I love you. 
I hate sin. I'm a just God. I can't look the other way. I have to deal with it. So either I can put that on you for all of eternity, or I can take that upon myself and then put upon you my righteousness that you can live forever with me. That's the God of whom we speak. And then the last verse there that we won't take the time to look up simply says, God is love. God is love. He demonstrates his love for us in a multitude of ways, but none as great as what he did stretched out on the cross. That's the God of whom we speak, and that's the God of the scriptures. So we'll pick up there next week. Um, if you haven't put your name on one of those white sheets, please do that, and, uh, and then hope to see you next week. And uh, let me offer a word of prayer before we quit. Father, thank you. Thank you for turning that spotlight on yourself to let us know you much better than just knowing you as the creator and, much, and, and just knowing you as the one who hates sin. Thank you for letting us know you as the one who loves us and the one who is willing to demonstrate that love in a most powerful way stretched out upon a cross. God, I pray every single one of us tonight can lay our heads down on the pillow knowing that we are dearly loved by you and fully forgiven by you. And may our, may our desire to get to know you better continue to grow, and may you continue to grant that deeper relationship so that we might be able to be a reflection of you in everything that we do. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming.